Welcome everyone to the Vanderbilt Center of Excellence Lunch and Learn. We're glad you could be with us. Um, we were hoping it'd be a sunny day for you to walk in, but uh, it didn't work out that way. We also want to invite and, and welcome uh, our online audience uh, at the Department of Children's Services. We are glad you can participate through this web stream and um, really grateful for our partnership with the Kennedy Center here and the Department of Children's Services uh, in the state of Tennessee to provide this training today. For those of you that are new and, and uh, haven't participated in a Center of Excellence Lunch and Learn, the COEs are, um, we're the academic partner for um, the state of Tennessee around children with really complex uh, mental health needs. So we provide consultation and some evaluation when appropriate for kids that are at risk, that are either at risk of going into custody or in custody. Um, so if you've got a case and you need a team to get together and talk about what are the best practices and needs for that child and problem solve as a team, please contact us. We're, we're, that's what we do um, well, is we team and help guide you and connect you with the best practices uh, for our kids. In addition to providing consultation and evaluation services, we also provide trainings in evidence-based practice or um, promising practices. So for example, we are actively involved in statewide dissemination of trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. We've done statewide dissemination projects around ARC, which is Attachment, Regulation, and Competence. We're also, our Vanderbilt Center of Excellence is responsible for the implementation and training of the CANS and FAST for the state of Tennessee. And so we work very closely with the Department of Children's Services to ensure training, fidelity, and the use of that um, particular tool. Today's training, we also provide monthly lunch and learns for our region, but then uh, streaming statewide, uh, that are relevant topics for to the work that we do. And I can't tell you how relevant uh, working with adolescents is to our work. And in fact, I, just a brief story, I um, was uh, in my office and a colleague of mine, Kathy Gracie said, she's knocking on the door, she said, John, I just heard this speaker, we've got to get her for Lunch and Learn, she's fantastic. And at the very same time, another COE professional, Mr. Michelle Moser was saying to me, John, I just heard this presenter, she's just great. And so I uh, reached out immediately to Mary and um, said, gosh, this is a great opportunity uh, to, to um, collaborate with you all and hear a little bit about your work. And so um, today we're gonna hear about the adolescent brain, kind of the neuroscience give us insight into adolescent health behavior. So if we could give a warm reception to Dr. Romano. Thank you, and thanks for the invitation and the kind words. So I am an adolescent medicine physician, which means that I only take care of teenagers in my practice. Um, I trained as a pediatrician and then did three years of fellowship so that I'm also board certified in adolescent medicine, which is its own subspecialty. And our clinic is unique because we do primary care for teenagers. So if you're a teenager that needs a sports physical or have a sore throat or a funky rash, we can take care of you, but we also do a lot of referral care. So a lot of pediatricians will send adolescents to us for things that are perhaps a little bit more than they might manage in primary care practice. And for us, that includes uh, the care of adolescents and young adults with eating disorders, some mood and mental health issues, and we do a lot of young women's health. So contraception, long-acting reversible contraception, and sexual health-related things. Um, so. That being said, I get asked a lot to talk to people about teenagers. I do a lot of talks to parents and PTAs, and I always joke that I usually start some of those parent lectures, which are a little bit more informal, by saying, hey, what kind of words come to mind when you think about teenagers? And usually at least the first five to 10 to 15 words are not positive. So, you know, I love teenagers, it's what I do, but I can also absolutely admit that they're an incredibly challenging and difficult population to work with. Um, I think they make sometimes seemingly unintelligent decisions. And I'm hoping that part of what this lecture will do is not excuse all and everything that they do, but put some of what they do and some of how they react into perspective. So. Today we're going to talk a little bit about puberty, adolescent psychosocial development, and how the two interact. Um, we're going to talk about some recent research, really recent research. I was just joking with John that my dad literally just sent me an article that I read as I was parking my car that I'll talk about. So some recent research in adolescent brain development and its effect on mood and behaviors. 
And then we'll talk a little bit about how to use this information to improve health outcomes for adolescents. Oops, sorry. So I sort of say, you know, when you think about the adolescent brain, what do you think about? And I, you know, this is sort of a cartoon representation. Very little bit of the brain is that, you know, if we think about the adolescent brain is spent on things that we think are of use, of value, of importance. I'm gonna reference this cartoon a lot. This is a Zitz cartoon, and it's just, they've got a lot of great cartoons about parents and teenagers. So this has got two parents where, I feel like this happens with my toddler too, they talk about how great their kid is, and instead of being excited, the parent's response is, why the heck don't they act like that at home? Like, that does not sound like my teenager at all. So teenagers can be quite the ever-changing beast. So first, just some terminology, puberty versus adolescence. So puberty refers to the physical changes that occur during adolescence. And so part of what happens during adolescence is you start out with a child's body and you end up with not only an adult body, but the ability to reproduce. Um, so right, so when girls achieve their period, obviously they should not start reproducing, but physiologically they're capable of reproduction. Same with males. When they are at the end of puberty, they're able to reproduce their producing sperm. So puberty refers to the physical attainment of sexual maturation. Adolescence is a much more ambiguous, less well-defined term in that it's a gradual period of transition from childhood to adulthood. Not everybody achieves adulthood at the same time. Some of us are still working on achieving adulthood. So it's a series of events. It's harder to quantify, right? When people go through puberty, we can look at their breasts, we can look at their genital development and say, you're at this stage of puberty, this should come next, this should come next, and this is about how long it should take. Adolescence is a different beast. It's different for everyone. It starts with a physical change, as we'll talk about in a couple of slides. Puberty tends to happen very early in adolescence, but the actual emotional psychosocial transition is a much slower, sometimes infinite work in progress. So the beginning of adolescence is marked by the onset of puberty. It's triggered by an increase in pituitary sensitivity to particular hormones that start those physical changes. And that hormone is gonadotropin releasing hormone. And what that results in is an increased release of androgens like testosterone and estrogen. We know that those androgens result in physical changes in weight, body shape, and genital development. The body you have at eight is not the body you have at 16, God willing. Um, there are five discrete stages of breast, pubic hair, and genitalia development, and we call those tanner stages. So puberty is defined by what tanner stage are you. And as physicians, we know there should be a fairly consistent logis logical progression of this, and we, that can alert us to the fact that there may be a physical problem in puberty. It different, it's different for boys and girls. So girls and boys start puberty at a different time, it goes at a different pace, and it ends at a different time. So one of the big questions that always comes up is, you know, is puberty happening earlier? Is the hormones in our meat and our milk and our makeup and in, in our shampoo causing us to develop earlier than we should be? And as physicians, we all joking aside, that is something that we care about. So it is well documented that the age of puberty has declined significantly over the last two decades. And of course the concern is how low is it gonna go? Is it gonna bottom out or is this an ongoing trend that has no end in sight? Back in 1997, Herman Giddens, who was a physician in North Carolina, she did a study where she looked at 17,000 females. And she found that the average age of breast development, which is usually the first thing to happen when puberty starts, is happening earlier than had been previously described. And I think more importantly, what she saw is there are ethnic differences. So Caucasians um, develop differently than African Americans, di differ differently than Hispanics. They didn't include other ethnicities in this original study, but what they did find was between Caucasians, Hispanics, and African Americans, there was some ethnic variation, which as physicians and as a parent is important to know, right? Because when I worry about a Caucasian patient having puberty problems, it may be different than when I worry about an African American patient. There is limited studies in males, and we'll talk a little bit about why that's so, but we do think that there's some evidence that obesity and probably the resultant increase in estrogen that occurs with obesity causes some delayed puberty in males. There is a now second study, right, so that was way back in 1997, which is now like 100 years ago. There is a new study that's ongoing that's being sponsored by the Breast Cancer Environmental Research Consortium, and they're doing a larger study. They're including more ethnicities, and what they're finding is there is there does seem to be a little bit of an ongoing shift in downtrending in when breast development starts. What we know now is the mean age of breast development is about 8.8 .8 years in African Americans and 9.9 .9 years in Caucasians. The preliminary data says that Hispanics probably fall somewhere in the middle, but the final data is still being tabulated. 
However, and this is sort of the most important medical thing, the mean age of when you start your period is pretty stable between 12 and 12 and a half years. And the reason that matters is we know that having an earlier age of first period or menarche increases your risk of breast cancer, which is why the Breast Cancer Consortium is sponsoring the study. So I think while we are seeing some earlier start to puberty, the actual end point of puberty, which is the onset of menses, seems to be relatively stable, which is good because that seems to be the biggest health risk. There are obviously some psychosocial risks to starting to look like a 13-year-old at eight, and there are obviously, I think, some important anticipatory guidance we can give to parents because while the average age of breast development in African Americans may be eight, some people are less than that, some people are more than that, so that means it's not abnormal for a six or seven-year-old to start to have breast development, and that could freak a parent out. So I think it's important for us to know that while this trend is okay and normal, it's things to know as physicians, it's things to know as providers, and things to talk to parents about. So I already talked about this, that you know, why does it matter? So having an earlier age of period inf confers an increased risk of breast cancer, and it also increases your chances of being obese. Again, so what we know is that the timing of puberty has different psychosocial impacts on boys and girls. So we know that males who develop earlier do well. They feel more self-confident. They feel better about themselves. It tends to not be a negative thing. However, we know that in girls, developing earlier confers negative consequences. Obviously, this does not happen to every girl that develops early, but we know that in general, girls that develop early tend to have lower self-esteem and they have more concerns about body image. They seem to be less worried about developing later as opposed to boys that seem to be more concerned about developing later, but we do know that girls who develop early can have issues down the road with self-esteem, which can often have them engaging in higher risk sexual behaviors. I think the other important thing to think about is anybody who works with adolescents, even though you look like a 13-year-old, if you are 10, your brain works like a 10-year-old. And so you can't treat the 10-year-old like a 13-year-old. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about brain development in adolescents. So shifting gears, that was sort of physical changes of adolescence. Now we're gonna talk about the psycho psychosocial tasks of adolescence. And for those of you who are in the psychology world and in the social work, work world, these are terms that you probably use more comfortably than I do, but I will do my best to explain them. Um, so what are you supposed to do as an adolescent? You're supposed to emotionally separate from your parents. You're supposed to have a greater sense of personal identity. You're supposed to sort of identify with a peer group. You're gonna have a little bit more importance to your body image and hopefully accept your body image and establish a sex vocational and moral identity. So we know that psychosocial development in adolescence is not a linear process, but we do divide it unofficially into three categories. There's early adolescence, middle adolescence, and late adolescence, and that kind of shows you where they mark off in years. And when we think about puberty, especially for girls, that's where most of the physical action is. So early adolescence, like I just said, because that's when a lot of the puberty changes are happening, that's when you see a lot of rapid physical changes. That's when you see a lot of preoccupation with self and image and a lot of uncertainty. Do I look like my peers? Why do I have breasts if my peers don't? We also see that parents become a little bit less important and there's definitely more importance placed on peers and relationships with peers. And we see a little bit more of that need for privacy. They're shutting the door, they don't want you to see them undress, and we start to see some of this parental separation. Middle adolescence is when we see a lot of the peak of child parental conflicts. There's more attempts at separation, and they may start to assign increased importance to other adult figures, which obviously makes it important who your teenagers are hanging out with, who are the peers that they're putting importance on, who are the adults they're putting importance on. And again, that can be negative or positive. We also see, especially for girls who kind of have done with, with puberty, their body's kind of done changing, right? The body they have is the body they have. And so that's when you start to see the preoccupation of how can I make this new body more attractive? What can I color my hair? What can I pierce? What can I tattoo? What can I draw on my, you know, so you see a lot of experimentation with different physical looks. They may start to have sexual relationships and there may be some sexual experimentation in either same sex or heterosexual relationships that doesn't necessarily predict what their final sexual identity will be. And we also see this feeling of omnipotence, right? Yeah, you say that if I have sex without a condom, I can get pregnant, but that's not gonna happen to me, right? That sort of, yes, that happens to other people, but I've, you know, I'm at, not at a risk. And we also see this limited capacity of abstract reasoning. How come you didn't know that if you did A, B would happen? 
And then late adolescence, in theory, in a perfect world, you'd like to see this reacceptance of parental advice and values. All of a sudden, parents are a little bit smarter than they used to be. A little bit more accepting of body and puberty changes, a little bit more of a refinement in moral and sexual values, and the ability to compromise and set limits. So in a perfect world, this is supposed to happen by 21. I don't know that all 21-year-olds have achieved all of these things. I know that I've achieved all of these things. There was an article in the New York Times probably now at least about 10 years ago that sort of said, do we need to come up with a new term, right? So we've got adolescence and then at 18 to 21, you're an adult. You don't need your parents' health care. You don't need, you know, you don't need anything. And obviously that's not true, right? Most 19, 20, 21 year olds are often still living at home and still fairly dependent on their parents or another adult. And so there was this article where they talked about this new term that was coined by psychologists and sociologists to kind of represent this ongoing transition to adulthood, right? Young adults are not little mini adults. They still need some safety nets and they still need some safeguards. And obviously for any of you that are involved in foster care, we know that that's a huge time of risk for young adults because they lose a lot of the safety nets they had a lot of in adolescence. Also, we know that the way our society is set up, you're not supposed to be self-sufficient at 21, right? A lot of people are in college and so there is a bit of, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't have my first job till I was done with medical school, which was like, 27 or 28. So there's this delayed attainment of end goals. You know, the question of course becomes, is that societal? Is that a luxury we have in a developed nation where you can delay this? Or is that a biological change that is consistent like the other stages of adolescence? And should we could be considered it another phase? Nobody's answered this question, but this is just kind of the discussion that is out there. I think the reason, at least in this country where we, we get so caught up in this discussion, is policy, right? So part of the push for pushing out the Affordable Care Act to cover people to their 26 is that at 21, you are not always a grown up. Okay, so done with the soapbox. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about adolescent brain development and how that sort of ties into some of the psychosocial behaviors that we see during adolescence. So in 2001, Geed and a bunch of colleagues at the National Institute of Mental Health did a study where they took early adolescents and scanned their brains with various imaging modalities over a period of years. And what they found was the adolescent brain is actually doing a lot. It's changing a lot in a way that's consistent, logical, predictable, and can kind of correlate to some of the behaviors that we see. So we do know that 90% of your brain development is achieved by six years of age. But what that really means is the gross architecture of your brain is there, and the general size of your brain is kind of a fixed thing. However, there seems to be this second growth spurt that occurs at the onset of adolescence. And then it's followed by organizational organization. So, so the brain is made of gray and white matter. Gray matter is kind of the brain stuff that does what your brain does. And the white matter is the insulation that kind of covers the gray matter, sort of like your wiring in your house, I'm not an electrician, so that the brain can send messages more efficiently because it's insulated. So what we know is there's a bit of a growth spurt during adolescence, and then there's some organization so that this gray and white matter are undergoing fairly dynamic changes that are consistent, logistical, and predictable throughout adolescence. And that's important because we couldn't, we didn't know that before. The imaging modalities that we have now allow us to get, get much more fine detail about brain changes and brain function than we could before. So we now know that there are three distinct processes, processes that occur during adolescence. Proliferation, so it grows, prunes, it gets cut back, and then myelination where the brain is laying down that insulation. So we know that subcortical areas of the brain show significant development during adolescence. So this is my very crude, I'm not a neurologist, explanation of the different brain areas. So if you think about your brain, you've got the little inner layer and the outer layer. The inner layer of your brain, and there's a better picture of this coming, is referred to as the subcortical area, the limbic system. And then you've got this cortical area, which is the outer layer of your brain. And we know that this inner layer develops earlier than this outer layer. And that will make more sense in a second. So we know that the limbic system, this inner layer, which is comprised of the amygdala and the nucleus accumbens, is associated with reward and pleasure-seeking activities. It is the part of your brain that when you do something good, gives you that warm and fuzzy feeling. And we know that the limbic system is up and running and growing and changing early on in puberty. In girls, it tends to peak at about 11 years of age, and at boys, it peaks at about 12 years of age. Cortical areas, the top part, develop later on. And that's specifically the area that we're gonna talk a lot about is the prefrontal cortex, so the frontal part of your brain. 
It demonstrates the greatest amount of growth of all the areas of the cortex, but it's also the last region of your brain to mature. So it's associated with the capacity to evaluate risk and reward. I call it the butt part of your brain, B-U-T, not B-U-T-T, -T, right? So it would be good to steal your parents' car keys and take a joyride, but I could get caught, but I could crash the car, but I could get arrested. So that butt part of the brain that makes you stop and think, as good as this gonna make me feel, what are the consequences, doesn't work early on in adolescence and takes a while to be up and running. So we know that while the cortical part of the brain is growing, it's also being pruned back. And I think one of the big things we wanna find out is, how does the brain know what to grow and what to get rid of? We've come up with some theories, but I think what would give us a lot of help and insight would be, how does your brain know what part to grow? How does your brain know what part to take away? We think that it, maybe it's related to experience, right? Use it or lose it. So somebody who's thinking and engaging and being more mentally challenged, perhaps their brain develops differently and better than a kid who's sitting on the couch playing video games. And so I think it speaks to the importance of adolescent experiences and exposures. The pruning phase, which is when we cut back the part of the brain, seems to be particularly sensitive to substance exposure. And so we know that adolescents exposed to alcohol at a younger age are at a greater risk for dependency or abuse. Some of that is probably genetics, but is that genetic factor related to how it changes the architecture of your brain? And again, the question always is, is it the fact that you drank early that changed the architecture of your brain, or genetically are you driven to have an earlier drink, and how do the two interact? We also know, hold on, okay. We also know that chronic marijuana use increases your risk of schizophrenia. And again, the thought is, and there actually was just a study that came out in Nature, I wanna say, in the last month or so, that's, that they've actually figured out what that is. So what they found is chronic marijuana use decreases the activity of the GABA neurons in your prefrontal butt section of your brain cortex, and the GABA neurons are the ones that slow your brain down, that keep it from getting too excited. And the thought is maybe marijuana use, by decreasing your sort of negative controlling aspects of your brain, allows the brain to fire a little more haphazardly and perhaps puts you at risk for schizophrenia. And so now what they're actually looking at is, is there a way to sort of counterbalance that effect to reverse some of those changes? So if we look at the brain, all right, you can do this pointer. So we know that the darker parts of the brain are where more area of the brain has been cut away. So if you see at age five, there's lots of brain matter there. And as you progress, your gray matter gets gradually stripped away by this pruning process. The last phase is what we call myelination, so laying down the insulation. We know that while the gray matter is decreasing during adolescence, the amount of white matter or insulation you have in your brain is going up. What that means is because actual brain pathways are insulated, instead of your whole brain being activated, if just this pathway needs to be needed, because it's insulated, all of a the sudden there's focal efficient communication because we've got focal recruitment of pathways as opposed to mass activation. We think that's because there's more myelination and that what it's doing is making your brain operate more efficiently and equally important, it's making the parts of your brain communicate better. So the pleasure seeking part of your brain is now more efficiently, more quickly, um, and more often communicating with the part of your brain that's capable of evaluating risk and reward. But we know that that myelination is the last thing to occur, so it happens much later in adolescence. We also know that myelination occurs back to front. And we said the part of your brain that's kind of the smartest is the front part of your brain, and that's the part of your brain that develops last. We know that the sensory and motor pathways mature earlier, and that these prefrontal cortex areas that are, again, are associated with this term that we call cognitive flexibility um, doesn't happen till later. So this you know, cognitive flexibility is the ability to say, hey, I'm gonna go to a party, and Tom is gonna drive me home. Now it's time to go home, and Tom is drinking. Crap, I have to come up with a plan B. Adolescents, because that prefrontal cortex is not as developed, don't have that ability to kind of, you know, the plan was A, and the ability to sort of change on the fly to plan B is a skill that develops later in time, which is why we often say, you know, adolescents have a brain in training, you have to help them, right? If an adolescent's plan is, hey, I'm gonna just leave my homework till the morning, 
a grown up would say, if I have 27 things to do in the morning, let me lay out my breakfast, let me lay out my clothes, let me pack my lunch, so the adolescents won't think like that because they don't have that cognitive flexibility. So it's up to us as adults to say, hey, here's a good idea. If you left you know, your history paper to do in the morning, let's do A, B, C, and D so that the morning is not a total scene of chaos. So this is just, again, better than my hands. This is your limbic system. This is your pre, sorry, I use this pointer for the online people. So this is your limbic system, and then this is your prefrontal cortex. And so what we see is that there's a relative imbalance between these two systems during adolescence. And so when we do functional MRIs, which are MRIs that don't just look at brain structure, but also look at what parts of your brain are going and what parts of your brain are communicating, we see that in younger adolescents, there's greater activity in the limbic system versus that prefrontal cortex in emotional situations. So when they get charged emotionally, their emotional center is up and running, and there's not a lot activated to rein them in. And this is a graphical, so this is your, just kidding, this is your prefrontal cortex, this is your limbic system, and you see it takes a while for them to be operating in sync. And so here, the teenage years, where they're not operating in sync is when teenagers are most at risk for making all of their fabulous decisions. So the question always becomes, you know, I had a patient come yesterday, her mom's like, she's moody, you need to check her hormones. Like measure her hormones, it's her hormones. And I think what we know now is hormones don't really account for everything. And so when we think about adolescence, you know, we think about this constant one day you're fine, one day you're crazy, one day you love me, one day you hate me. And a lot of times we blame that on hormones. So we know that some brain, some brain changes happen before puberty even kicks in. We know that some brain changes are the result of hormones. But we also know that some of adolescent brain maturation is independent of puberty. And so it has nothing to do with hormones. We know, not shockingly, that the behaviors with the strongest link to pubertal development is sexual interest, romantic motivation, appetite and mood, and so it's normal for adolescents to have a little bit of mood change, a little bit of appetite change during the adolescence years, and obviously often what I'm asked to do is, you know, is this a moody teenager or is this depression? Is this an adolescent change in appetite or is this an eating disorder? We also know that the behaviors that seem to have a strong link to puberty development is that risk, that risk taking desire, you know, that desire to get that dopamine urge from your limbic system to make them feel good. We know that the transition to adulthood is learning to rein in all of those feelings and that that involves a prefrontal cortex that hasn't developed, right? Because we talked about how puberty is kind of done by 12, 13, 14 for boys. But what we know is that the prefrontal cortex takes years to develop. So we know that planning and logic and the reasoning ability is a time dependent process that it needs time to occur, that it's independent of pubertal timing. So if you develop at 10 or 15, your prefrontal cortex is still on the same path. And so the question becomes, you know, those teenagers that develop early, whose limbic system is up and running earlier than somebody who develops later, they have less capacity to rein that in because their prefrontal cortex just isn't developed yet. So knowing all of that fascinating neuroscience, I tried to kind of pick the aspects of adolescent behaviors that are often the most baffling, challenging, confusing, and sort of relate it back to the research to kind of give it some perspective. So again, what are teenagers? They are moody. Hormones only explain part of it, and we think a large part of the moodiness is this imbalance between the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex. Most psychiatric disorders, right, depression, anxiety, sort of schizotypal uh, characteristics, maybe not necessarily full-blown schizophrenia, will manifest during adolescence. Normal adolescence, right, involves this coordination of emotions and behavior, and so perhaps there's some genetic predisposition in patients with mental illness where that coordination doesn't occur the way it's supposed to. We know that this natural, right, there's a natural tendency in adolescence for your emotions to get the better of you. And perhaps this natural tendency allows psychiatric illness to manifest. It doesn't cause them, but there's already a natural tendency to be driven by emotions. And perhaps that's why in adolescence we see so many psychiatric illnesses manifest. Early research does show that there's some dysregulation of the amygdala, which is in 
the limbic system in teens with anxiety and depression. We see that in teens that have anxiety, that limbic system seems to be activated for longer. And we also see sometimes, so the reverse of things like depression and anxiety, things like ADHD sometimes go away during adolescence. And sometimes that may we think that may have to do with some of the pruning that occurs. On the flip, perhaps some of the pruning that occurs allows things like schizophrenia to present in that time period. Again, I think we know that all of these things could be the reason. The next step is obviously to get more concrete data. So this woman named Dr. Jurgen Todd did a study back in 2002 with these petrifying pictures. Um, and what she did was she took pictures like this and showed them to teenagers and said, what is this person? Are they mad? Are they sad? Are they happy? Are they angry? And what she found were teenagers more often misinterpreted emotional cues and they were more likely to interpret, interpret any face that wasn't obviously happy as angry. They were also quicker to react to emotion and they seemed to activate different parts of their brain, the limbic system, more as a teenager than they did as an adult. And as that got older, it shifted to the prefrontal cortex. And you see that a lot, right? The parent will be like, well, she just came home and I said, hey, how's your report card? And she flipped out, I don't know why. And what we know is that teenagers don't have the, a great capacity to sort of evaluate, you know, stop and think, kind of like, you know, you get a text message and you're like, oh, that person sounded mad. And then you stop and you think, you're like, well, no, it's a text message. Maybe they didn't mean it. Maybe So we can sort of put those responses in perspective. Teenagers kind of see something, it doesn't seem right, and they're done. Their, their limbic system is up, and then they're going. So she found that teenagers very quickly saw anger and got activated by it. So in addition to Moody, a lot of teenagers make less than intelligent decisions in their behaviors, right? They're risk takers. They're climbing the fence to jump in the pool. They're, you know, so. Adolescence, and I think this is sort of where I get the most passion for my work, you know, they're a fairly paradoxical population. So they're healthy, right? Most adolescents do not have heart disease and high blood pressure. You know, they're basically a healthy population, but their morbidity and mortality increases by 200%. Um, the leading causes of death in adolescence are accidents, homicide, and suicide. Those are behavior related, right? So it's not an illness. Obviously, some adolescents, unfortunately, do die of illnesses, but most of the injury and death that we see is behavior related. So this looks at the, so this could be the same for morbidity and mortality, um, but this is the morbidity graph. So we see that motor vehicle accidents, unintended injury, suicide, homicide, and even HIV to some extent for some people, right, is a behavioral consequence or is a consequence of a sexual behavior they may have engaged in. So at least 70% of adolescent morbidity and mor mortality is related to the decisions that they make. So it's certainly helpful for us who take care of them to figure out is there any way to help them make better decisions? If someone has the answer to that, you'll put me out of a job. <laughs> so we know that in adolescence, because of all the changes that go on in the limbic system, there's a need for increased stimulation to create similar feelings of reward. So dopamine levels are going up and down. Serotonin levels are going up and down. We know that dopamine is related to feeling good when you do something, and serotonin is related to feeling good in terms of your mood. And we know that these two hormones are up and running, and they're very sensitive to anything that disrupts them. Drugs, alcohol, stress, lack of sleep. So we thought that the we think that the impulsive behaviors that we see in adolescents is thought to be secondary to the immaturity of the prefrontal cortex and its inability to rein in that pleasure-seeking limb limbic system. Now, there are mitigating factors. Not every teenager is out on the street selling drugs and drunk. You know, so so everybody's different. There's individual variation, and the thought is that maybe some of that individual variation is due to what your dopamine receptors or your serotonin receptors may look like based on your genetics, and obviously peer pressure and environmental pressures that cannot you know that we can't control for. We do know that adolescents who self-report increased tendency to take risk behaviors have greater activation of the limbic system when they're making that decision. And that's independent of age. So that's where genetics plays a role. So Dr. Steinberg did a study that looked at driving, right? Because one of the places where we see teens take a lot more risk than they should is when they're driving. So he did a study at Temple University, 
back in 2005. And basically the way the study was designed was he took teenagers and he took adults and they had like a simulated driving game. And you had to get from point A to point B. And the quicker you got from point A to point B, the more points you got. But the more bad decisions you made along the way, you got points taken away. So like running red lights, side swiping baby carriages, you know, would deduct points. And so he, he had adolescents play the game and he had teen uh, adults play the game. And what he found was, when there wasn't anything going on and they were just sitting quietly driving, they actually performed pretty similarly. Adolescents in a calm, controlled environment made relatively smart decisions that were not that different than adults. But when they added emotion, so someone screaming at them, radio, all of the sudden the limbic system got more active and they made poorer decisions. And I think the most interesting, part, well, it's all interesting, but one of the really interesting things was, so we can all appreciate if somebody's yelling, screaming, the music is blasting, you're not gonna drive as well. But what they found was having friends in the car, which should be a positive thing, right? I'm going out with my friends. It made them make poor decisions. And taking the peers away, their decisions all of a sudden got much better. And what do teenagers often do? When they're with their friends, they make the dumbest decisions. You know not to, yeah, but we were all there and it seemed, you know. So what he found was having peers there amped up the activity in your limbic system. You didn't have a prefrontal cortex to say, hey, but no, 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 bad idea. And they made poorer decisions. Um, that's part of what led to that, you know, we have these graduated license laws now. That's why teenagers, when they first start driving, are not allowed to have all those passengers in the car because we know it makes them not as good drivers. And sort of the parting message that Steinberg said in his article was, you know, more is not only merrier for teenagers, more is riskier. So what about substance use? So we know that it affects the adolescent brain differently, right? Why don't we smoke or drink or do pot because it's illegal, but while we're pregnant? Because you've got a brain growing inside of you. Well, the adolescent brain is growing too, and so you don't, you know, you don't expose a developing brain to toxins. The same goes for adolescents. We know that especially when it comes to alcohol, adolescents are, you know, so why do we stop drinking? We pass out and we feel awful the next day. Adolescents don't get hungover like adults do. They don't pass out the way adults do. So they're less susceptible to the short-term effects, which is not so great because that's sometimes what makes us not do it again, but they seem to be more susceptible to the long-term effects like memory ability and cognitive flexibility. And we also know that the earlier you drink, the more likely you are to have a risk. So you have a 40% risk of having a problem with alcohol if you have your first drink by 15 versus 7% if you have that first drink at 21. Again, genetics, is it's, it's not all behavior. Some of it's gonna be genetics that compels you to have that early drink, but we know that exposing an adolescent brain to alcohol makes a difference. Um, Dr. White down in Duke did a study and she saw that in adolescence, alcohol targets the hippocampus. That's the part of your brain that's concerned with memory. So that's sh what she found was that adolescents who drank a lot continued to have memory loss despite alcohol cessation. And they were quicker to black out even though they didn't pass out. And those effects correlated to how early it was when you took your first drink. And then Dr. Jacobson did a similar study. What she did was she did, she, excuse me, she looked at working memory. So uh, comprehension, you read a paragraph and like 30 minutes later you had to answer questions based on what you um, remembered about the paragraph. And adolescents who smoked had a harder time with that. And it was directly related to how early they had had their first cigarette. So the earlier you started smoking, the less well you were likely, the worst you were likely to do. And in animal studies, we know that nicotine is a neurotoxin. So smoking early seems to have more of a negative effect on your brain. And then we just talked about this, the study about the marijuana and the prefrontal cortex. So we know that toxins on a teenage brain are targeting a brain that's under development. So it's gonna have a consequence. And then we think about adolescence and sleep, right? Because what do they wanna do? Sleep always, always. There's actually just an article in the New York Times today that my dad just sent me on the drive here that looked at the economic impact of letting adolescents go to school later. Um, and it was interesting, we'll talk about it in a second. So we know that in adolescence there's a shift in your circadian rhythm. You wanna go to bed later and wake up later. So we know that melatonin, which is the chemical that your body makes to get you ready for sleep, peaks between 11 and 12 years of age, and then your natural wake up time is between nine and 10. And it takes you a little longer to wind down at bedtime. 
right? Think about the average teenager. Teens need nine and a half hours of sleep per night, but we know that teens report an average of about seven to eight hours of sleep per night. So most teens are chronically sleep deprived. And this is clearly a dated picture because I think there's like an iPod in there. So there'd be no wires if we did this picture today. But we know that thanks to technology and life and everything, I mean, they're just, you could be sleeping and getting text messages if you want to. So we know that chronic sleep deprivation, which based on that statistics is most probably most people in this room, and most adolescents, right? It gives you difficulty with, intention, uh, with attention. It makes you more likely to be depressed. It makes you more likely to be anxious. It makes you more likely to be emotionally labile, which is what teenagers are more likely to be to begin with. And then we're making it worse by taking away their sleep. We know that in schools that have earlier start times, there are increased rates of motor vehicle accidents by stu student drivers. And then at schools with later start times, we see some improved academic performance, um, decreased depression. But then the question becomes, if they start school later, when are they gonna do all those awesome activities that are gonna make their brain develop better, right? So when are they gonna do football? You know, so it's, it's finding that balance. And this article in the New York Times today talks about, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics says that high school should start at 8.30. Most teenagers are like on the bus at six. In my neighborhood, it's like six in the morning they're getting on the bus. Um, and they estimate that if they were to shift that time, that it would probably add like $83 million to our ink because it would be less, it's a, obviously an extrapolated number, um, because there'd be less motor vehicle accidents and those teenagers would probably have higher productivity and greater academic performance. On the front end, it would cost about $110 per student because the, ship, the bus schedule would have to shift, but there would probably be a lot of benefit to letting students start school later. I don't know that that's, you know, certain school districts have done it, but that's kind of this ongoing debate in the adolescent world. For those of you that are on the PTA, it's like a hot topic. Um, <laughs> So another interesting whoops, study that was done was by Dr. Smith in Ontario. And what he did was he gave teenagers, it was like a ball in a maze and you had to kind of figure out how to get the ball from point A to point B. And you know, obviously over time they would figure it out. And then he would sort of let some sleep and let some not sleep as much. And what he found was memories that were made the day before were retained better by those who got adequate sleep. Because we know that information that you acquire during the day is processed during your REM sleep. We know that the formation of memories and learning retention is dependent on getting enough sleep. And so teens' performance is probably related to not just getting the hours, right, because they can nap from four to whatever, you know, but it's also sleeping during the time when their body wants them to sleep based on their circadian rhythm. So they get not just sleep, but adequate REM sleep, because that's when you're making your memories. Um, and his sort of parting line was that better than the SATs, what was gonna predict how well people did in college was, did they sleep? Which we know college students don't. Or when they do, it's like, I stay up on late, I take my test, and then I sleep. So now what do we do, right? Like, that's all great information. So now what do I do with this? So we know that to some extent, there's probably a biologic basis for adolescent behavior. We've got emotionally activated, intensified brain without the mature necessary system for regulation and control. And that the transition to adulthood involves integration of these two systems. So we need to understand the disconnect, right? Your adolescent is not stupid, right? So you, know, you, you have to kind of be like, what? how come you didn't know better? Because in a way, their brain doesn't work in a way that allows them to do that. So we sort of say the adolescent brain is all gasoline with no brakes and more importantly, no steering wheel. So it's not always effective to appeal to logic like you would in a grown up. You need to help them with planning ahead, right? So when I see a patient who's sexually active, who's like, well, I'm just gonna use condoms. I don't need to be on birth control. Okay, who's gonna buy the condoms? Do you have money to buy the condoms? Where are you gonna keep the condoms? What if when you take the condom out, your partner's like, yeah, no, thank you. I don't wanna use that. So, so that, you know, here's my plan. Well, how are you gonna carry out that pen? Well, I'm gonna go in the pill and I'm not gonna tell my mom. Okay, well, how are you gonna get to the pharmacy every month to pick up that prescription? What happens if the bill comes to your mom's house and she's like, why are you getting, the, you know, so, so helping them think things through because they may not. I do a lot of role playing, right? So, hey, you wanna use condoms? Okay, so you take out the condom, I'm gonna be your boyfriend and I'm gonna say no thank you. How are you gonna work through that situation? So pointing out consequences that are abundantly evident to us 
but not always abundant to the adolescent. So you wanna be a neurosurgeon, that's awesome. You're also smoking marijuana every day. How do you see those two kind of coming to the same result? Again, it seems obvious to us, but we know that that adolescent has that limited capacity for abstract reasoning. Again, this is not to explain away everything, but they're a brain in training, right? I'm training my toddler to tie her shoe and to be potty trained. You kind of have to train an adolescent to think, which sounds silly, but sort of how these things work. So talking through difficult situations, engaging them in discussions, helping them practice their reasoning, and then repetition. So every time you come, I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen if you have sex without a condom. Um, because maybe you're gonna hear me this time and you didn't hear me last time. Um, and also I just think it speaks to the importance of extracurricular activities, right? So when we see little kids at risk, they get put in, um, early intervention, right? We're like, ooh, you're in a risky home, let's get you engaged in all these activities to make sure your brain thrives. Adolescents who are not gonna have the luxury of being in all these extracurricular activities because perhaps their family structure or the, whatever their home life is like doesn't allow it, should probably get some of the same intervention and help and safety net. And then I think it's important to think about younger adolescents versus older adolescents. So younger adolescents are driven by their reward system. So you know, for my 12-year-old that smokes, telling her that she's gonna get lung cancer in 20 years, she could care less. But telling her that the $5 or $10 or whatever it costs to buy a cigarette, um, you know, that she spends today on the cigarette, if she saved it for five weeks, could buy her shoes, well then maybe that's an immediate reward. You know, so dying of lung cancer doesn't matter, but your teeth turning yellow tomorrow, that's an immediate risk and a reward that you can appreciate. And then again, adolescents that are older, they're starting to develop some self-regulatory behaviors. We just need to train them to stop and think, hey, wait a minute, listen to what you're saying. Let's just think about how that's gonna play out. And then again, not to soapboxy, but thinking about public policy implications. So when should adolescents be able to consent? You know, there was a whole, I think it was Frontline that did this, you know, the punishment of adolescent offenders. Is, should there be a thing like juvenile death penalty? Should adolescents, you know, at what point do adolescents get tried as adults? Because if you look at the data that they did at that study, adolescents' brains were developing well into their 20s. So even a 25-year-old probably doesn't have a brain that functions like an adult. So at what point are you an adult and capable of being held to adult consequences, you know, age of voting, age of drinking, when should healthcare terminate? Never. Um, and then should there be some kind of Head Start program for adolescents? So, in conclusion, with 10 minutes for questions, adolescents, we know that adolescence is a time of rapid physical, emotional growth and development. We know that the adolescent brain and how it functions or doesn't function can play a large role in adolescent behaviors, although it certainly doesn't explain everything. Um, and understanding, I think, the neuroscience can help healthcare providers and anybody that interfaces with adolescents provide education, counsel parents, and I think, you know, importantly for all of us that are in the public sector, engage in policy discussions to improve adolescent health behaviors and outcomes. And if anybody is super interested in all of this, this frontline documentary, which is old but awesome, I can't get my pointer to go there, um, goes through all of this and they interview a lot of the people who did a lot of these studies and they interview, it's really interesting, so I highly recommend it. Okay, questions, thoughts, yes. You're gonna wait for oh, the microphone now? Okay. And then Hi. you can articulate them quickly? Yes, thank you. So my questions are about the, if you know of any research related to brain development um, and technology use. I know that I've read some really recent um, interesting articles. I think one was in the Atlantic that talked yeah. about the iGen and all like yeah. the psychosocial development around that. And then the second part of my question is um, technology and brain development and um, sexual health. And I was interested if you had seen anything in your work with adolescents related to um, uh, use of um, online pornography and how all of yeah. all of that stuff kind of connects yeah. together. So I don't think there's like an overarching, we have so much data that we can make a blanket statement. I think the general consensus is that um, everybody's different and so some people have more addictive personalities than others so some adolescents who engage in technology are going to take it to a level where it's problematic whereas others might not. I think we do know that adolescent technology use at least from a sleep hygiene standpoint needs to be cut off for them so adolescents shouldn't have a phone in their room. I tell my parents at a certain time the phone gets put into your possession to be charged and they can get it back in the morning because we definitely know that technology use and the light and the circadian rhythm is going to throw off their sleep. Um, I think a lot of the research, I guess, that I see has to do with bullying, too, and just in terms of, I think, with 
I think with parents as much as adolescents, and I think it's important even more so to start at the toddler age, right? So I would be tempted to be like, look at this awesome learning program. Like here, let me use this to teach my toddler. You know, nothing trumps human interaction. So, you know, computers should not replace how you teach your kids. Computers should not replace how you teach your kids to interact with other people. And so I think sort of the thought is, screen time should be an hour a day, that's it. Not, you know, not limiting, or not limiting, but not including, I guess, what you have to do for school, but I mean, the, the policy is you get an hour a day. Obviously, there are extenuating circumstances, but I mean, real life interactions trump everything. There are some great resources online that have like internet contracts that I often use for parents that are really struggling. Um, but I think while we don't have a policy statement, that the thought is, you know, limit it, real life should trump it, and certainly rules about when it should be used and where it should be used. Quickly, in terms of the pornography thing, I mean, I don't know that there's any evidence that shows that engaging in online pornographic viewing puts you at risk for more like high-risk sexual taking behaviors. Obviously, if people have like personality disorders where they're seeking out deviant pornography, there, there are correlations there. I think the biggest thing is reminding patients that what they see in pornography is, you know, like having sex is not like in a porn, right? So like, I just think managing expectations um, is probably where we do the most education, at least now in our clinic. And I think just making sure parents are aware, like you need to be really vigilant about these things. Other questions? Would you say Wait, did more, the microphone. Would you say more about what you meant by head start for adolescents? So that's just like, a, it was a pipe dream that I said. But no, I mean, what I, I, so I don't work with little kids, but my understanding of Head Start is that you, we can identify, right? We know little kids who are gonna be at risk. Maybe they're in a family structure where they're not gonna get read to as often, or they're not gonna have adult supervision. And we put those kids in programs where they get read to and positive adult interactions. Teenagers who are not, you know, teenagers who are gonna go home to an empty house and sit and play video games for 12 hours, through no fault of their parents, maybe because of work or financial constraints, those teenagers need some kind of, I think, mandatory engagement in the kid whose parents can let them play 57 sports seven days a week. So I guess that was sort of my thing. Yes. There was a hand there, but then you put it down, so I'm gonna assume that you took your question back. <laughs> What are your thoughts on um, the school start times for elementary school age children? Because just from personal experience, my six-year-old has to be in her seat ready to work at 7.15 a.m. And I don't want, I don't even want to read an email as an adult or anybody to talk well, to me I mean, at 7.15. Well, I mean, I will say this. That I don't know what your toddler's like. My kid's up at six in the morning, so yeah. she could probably go to school. No. Um, so I think on the one hand, I think two things. I think two factors come into play. Zirconium rhythm is such in, a, in kids that they can be up and functioning a little bit earlier. So I don't think eight, seven, eight o'clock is an unreasonable expectation for little kids. I think the other big mitigating factor is most little kids go to bed earlier, right? So they're not, you know, they're not out late at practice, hopefully, um, and they're not doing homework, hopefully, till 10, 11 o'clock at night. So I think the, the flip of that is um, pediatric or little kids get to go to bed earlier. Most teenagers, by the time they get home, eat dinner, have their family dinner with their family, and then do their homework, I mean, it's 10, 11 o'clock before they can get to bed. And I think the interesting thing was, you know, the the pushback to the adolescent start time being later was like, well, if you tell a teenager they don't have to be up till nine, like they'll just stay up till two in the morning. And that wasn't true. In schools where they shifted start times, kids went to bed at the same time. So they just got more sleep. They didn't shift their sleep. They went to bed at the same time. They just got to sleep in a little bit later. I think the biggest barrier is also just busing because I guess we use the same bus for everybody. So if everybody goes to school at the same time, that's more traffic. We don't want more traffic. <laughs> oh, sorry. There, sorry. Not up to me. What is your suggestion as far as resistance with a teenager whenever you want to try to have a community or open up communication with them? Don't look um, them in the eye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, for instance, someone that you don't, I'm a CASA advocate. So someone that you've got somewhat of a relationship mm -hmm. with and you want to make them feel comfortable, i.e. sex, right. drugs, so, yeah. have these conversations. It's like, oh, whatever, I know. You know, yes. I, I talk I talk to my friends. Right. I know all about right. that. And they shut down. Right. So I think it depends because I don't know that I, I know the exact sort of setup. So like I have to talk to my patients about that 
all the right. So when they come for a well check, you know, eating, exercise, and then we launch into all the good stuff. But I mean, from a like what I often tell parents is, I wasn't joking. Talk to your teenager when you're not looking them in the eyes, right? So when you're sitting in the car and every, right? Because teenagers, when they look you in the face, all you need to do is move your eyebrow wrong and you're done. They're done with you. You you copped an attitude. So talk to them when you're, don't have to write. So car is the best time to have a conversation because everybody's looking forward. Um, the other thing I think is use other scenarios. So like if you're, and again, I don't know if this will work in your specific scenario, but like for parents, if there's a TV show on and something's happening, like, hey, that kid's talking about having sex with their girlfriend. Is that something you ever talk about? And maybe have it relate to a character in le instead of the teenager. Um, and then the other thing I always tell parents, and I think the same would go for you, it, they can tell you they're done. Keep talking, they're listening, right? Even when teenagers are shutting down, they're listening. When we look at the biggest predictor of how old teens are when they first start having sex, parental expectation plays a big role. So even if you think they're like, I know mom, stop talking, they hear your expectation, they hear your values, and they're listening even though they're not engaging you in the conversation. Is it horrible to say that I was there, it's relatable? I mean. So I think that's a personal decision. So the question is, you know, do you say, you know, because I always go, well, what if I told them I had sex at fate? I think that's a personal decision. I think sometimes you open up a can of worms that you might not want to keep answering those questions. <laughs> Which, no, I mean, I just, I think every parent is different. I think okay. if it is a way to have a good, ongoing, open dialogue with your teenager, then do it. Okay. Some parents might not feel comfortable. The other thing I also always tell parents is, you know, a lot of times they don't start the conversation because they're afraid they won't know the answer. Teenagers love it when they're smarter than you. So say, you know what, I don't know that answer. Let's go find it. Or let's go ask your doctor. Or let's go look it up. Because then, you know, I mean, I do that all the time with my teens and like social media. I'm like, I don't know what this thing is. Show me how this works. But now I've engaged them and now all of a sudden they think they're cooler than me, which yeah. they are, but right. And then I can, I have an in to talk about social media. So how do you use this? What happens if somebody sends you a message and they're mean on it, then what do you do? Okay. So play the fool. Is that yeah. what they tell you with toddlers? Like play dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, I have a question about the uh, idea of the imbalance between the subcortical and cortical systems. So um, I guess the major hypothesis is that imbalance creates these behavioral problems. So uh, I'm wondering about the timing uh, in causation. So is it that um, you know development of the limbic system? Uh, pace is development of the prefrontal cortex, or is it development of the prefrontal cortex that paces development of the limbic system? Because that would have implications in terms of what you focus on in terms of your intervention. Oh, absolutely. I think it's a, a multitude of factors. So I think it's definitely that there's a outpacing of the limbic system development over the prefrontal cortex, but it's not, excuse me, it's not just how big they are, it also, and I didn't wanna, it's also how they communicate. So what we see over time is not just that the prefrontal cortex gets bigger or more active, it's that the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex communicate over time, whereas in the beginning, there are two separate entities. So as teenagers get to be young adults, we see that those two areas of the brain are not operating as separate entities. We also see that the pathways by which they communicate are becoming more efficient. So because of not just the sheer size changes, but the myelination um, that's occurring, we see that there's more focal recruitment and so that the brain just works more efficiently. So I think it's not, so it's definitely that the limbic system gets up and running and it outpaces the prefrontal cortex because eventually it does catch up, but it's also the way they communicate. And so I think when we talk about where to focus our attention, I think we all first have to know, you know, like when they talk about the marijuana effect, you know, how does the how does marijuana negatively affect the brain? And so what they just found out is that marijuana seems to decrease the activity of the GABA neurons in the prefrontal cortex. And so that's what they're going to target, right? Some, apparently you can take like a GABA booster. Or so. so I think it's not just size, it's communication and how efficiently and quickly and focally they communicate, if that makes sense or answers your question. So we also have a question submitted online. I'll read it. How do you manage the use of psychotropic meds on their developing brain? So I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a pharmacologist, so I'll make that disclaimer. Um, I mean, I think for starters, right, we don't know how any drug works on a developing brain. Um, all we really have, which may not be the best answer to say, is we have the research. We know that um, 
safety studies have looked at long-term effects of some psychotropic medications. Obviously, there are some psychotropic medications that we don't use as often in um, teenagers. If we're talking about psychotropic medications that I use, the one I use most often is SSRIs, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or antidepressants, and those are fairly well studied in adolescents. Again, nobody's done, because you can't, um, nobody's done um, brain imaging related to them, but we know the long-term consequences of patients that have taken them, and they're few and far between. And so I think anytime you make a decision to use a psychotropic medication, you have to balance the known risks. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not, to the known risk of having um, an untreated mental illness. I know that's a big debate, not in the adolescent world, but in the OB world, right? So what are the consequences of taking an antidepressant during pregnancy? you have to weigh the risk of having an incredibly depressed mom who can't function. And so I think that's where sometimes it is a decision that has to get made with the physician's input, obviously, but with the collaboration of the patient, depending on their age and the family, of risk of medication versus risk of whatever you're trying to treat. I don't know if that answers your question because I can't see your face, but I'm going to hope so. <laughs> I think I have like half a second if anybody has a pressing question. It's like creeping on 1 o'clock. Cool, we're done. Okay. No problem. Thank you, guys. You're a great audience. So we've uh, we've just sent out um, a reminder for satisfaction surveys. We uh, for to continue this training effort, um, we rely on your feedback so that we can uh, report that out. So please take two minutes. And uh, in the next 24 hours, the link that we've provided will be active for you to do your feedback survey online. So please, whether it's on your phone or at your desk, in the next 24 hours. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next month. Thank you.